All righty. I'm back with the next chapter of Fire and Blood during when House of the Dragon takes place. The Dying of the Dragons, the Blacks, and the Greens. The Dance of the Dragons is the flowery name bestowed upon the savage internecine struggle, yeah, for the Iron Throne of Westeros, fought between two rival branches of House Targaryen during the years 129 to 131 AC. To characterize the dark, turbulent, bloody doings of this period as a dance strikes us as grotesquely inappropriate. No doubt the phrase originated with some singer. The dying of the dragons would be altogether more fitting, but tradition, time, and Grand Maester Munkin have burned the more poetic usage into the pages of history, so we must dance along with the rest. There were two principal claimants to the Iron Throne upon the death of King Viserys I Targaryen, his daughter Rhaenyra, the only surviving child of his first marriage, and Aegon, his eldest son by his second wife. Amidst the chaos and carnage brought on by their rivalry, other would-be kings would stake claims as well, strutting about like mummers on a stage for a fortnight or a moon's turn, only to fall as swiftly as they had risen. The dance split the Seven Kingdoms in two, as lords, knights, and small folk declared for one side or the other and took up arms against one another. Even House Targaryen itself was divided, when the kith, kin, and children of each of the claimants became embroiled in the fighting. Over the two years of struggle, a terrible toll was taken on the great lords of Westeros, together with their bannermen, knights, and small folk. Whilst the dynasty survived, the end of the fighting saw Targaryen power much diminished and the world's last dragons vastly reduced in number. The dance was a war unlike any other ever fought in the long history of the Seven Kingdoms. Though armies marched and met in savage battle, much of the slaughter took place on water and, especially, in the air, as dragon fought dragon with tooth and claw and flame. It was a war marked by stealth, murder, and betrayal as well, a war fought in shadows and stairwells, council chambers and castle yards with knives and lies and poison. Long simmering, the conflict burst into the open on the third day of the third mood of 129 AC, when the ailing, bedridden King Viserys I Targaryen closed his eyes for a nap in the Red Keep of King's Landing and died without waking. His body was discovered by a serving man at the hour of the bat, when it was the king's custom to take a cup of Hippocras. The servant ran to inform Queen Alicent, whose apartments were on the floor below the king's. Septon Eustace, writing on these events some years later, points out that the manservant delivered his, tire, his dire tidings directly to the queen and her alone without raising a general alarm. Eustace does not believe this was wholly fortuitous. The king's death had been anticipated for some time, he argues, and Queen Alicent and her party, the so-called Greens, had taken care to instruct all of Viserys' guards and servants in what to do when the day came. The Dwarf Mushroom suggests a more sinister scenario, whereby Queen Alicent hurried King Viserys on his way with a pinch of poison in his Hippocross. It must be noted that Mushroom was not in King's Landing the night the king died, but rather on Dragonstone in service with Princess Rhaenyra. Queen Alicent went at once to the king's bedchamber, accompanied by Sir Criston Cole, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Once they had confirmed that Viserys was dead, her grace ordered his room sealed and placed under guard. The serving man who had fought, found the king's body was taken into custody to make certain he did not spread the tale. Sir Christian returned to White Sword Tower and sent his brothers of the king's guard to summon the members of the king's small council. It was the hour of the owl. Then, as now, the sworn brotherhood of the king's guard consisted of seven knights, men of proven loyalty and undoubted prowess, who had taken solemn oaths to devote, to devote their lives to defending the king's person and kin. Only five of the White Cloaks were in King's Landing at the time of Viserys' death. Sir Criston himself, Sir Arik Cargill, Sir Rickard Thorne, Sir Stephen Darklin, and Sir Willis Fell. Sir Eric Cargill, twin to Sir Arik, and Sir Laurent Marbrand, with Princess Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, remained unaware and uninvolved as their brothers-in-arms went forth into the night to rouse the members of the small council from their beds. The council convened in the Queen's apartments within Magor's Holdfast. Many accounts have come down to us of what was said and done that night. By far the most detailed and authoritative of them is Grand Maester Munkin's The Dance of the Dragons, A True Telling. 
Though Munkin's exhaustive history was not written until a generation later and drew on many different sorts of materials, including Maester's Chronicles, memoirs, stewards, records, and interviews with 147 surviving witnesses to the great events of these times, his account of the inner workings of the court relies upon the confessions of Grand Maester Orwell as set down before his execution. Unlike Mushroom and Septon Eustace, whose versions derive from rumors, hearsay, and family legend, the Grand Maester was present at the meeting and took part in the council's deliberations and decisions, though it must be recognized that at the time he wrote, Orwell was most anxious to show himself in favorable light and absolve himself of any blame for what was to follow. Munkin's true telling therefore paints his predecessor in perhaps too favorable a light. Gathering in the Queen's chambers as the body of her lord husband grew cold above were Queen Alice and herself, her father, Sir Otto Hightower, hand to the king, Sir Kristen Cole, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Grand Maester Orwell, Lord Lyman Beesbury, Master of Coin, a man of eighty, Sir Tyland Lannister, Master of Ships, brother to the Lord of Casterly Rock, Laris Strong, called Laris Clubfoot, Lord of Harrenhal, Master of Whispers, and Lord Jasper Wilde, called Ironrod, Master of Laws. Grand Maester Munkin dubs this gathering the Green Council in his true telling. Grand Maester Orwell opened the meeting by reviewing the customary tasks and procedures required at the death of a king. He said, Septon Eustace should be summoned to perform the last rites and pray for the king's soul. A raven must needs be sent to Dragonstone at once to inform Princess Rhaenyra of her father's passing. Mayhaps her grace the queen would care to write the message so as to soften these sad tidings with some words of condolence. The bells are always rung to announce the death of a king, someone should see to that, and of course we must begin to make our preparations for Queen Rhaenyra's coronation. Sir Otto Hightower cut him off. All this must needs wait, he, de he declared, until the question of succession is settled. As the king's hand, he was empowered to speak with the king's voice, even to sit the Iron Throne in the king's absence. Viserys had granted him the authority to rule over the Seven Kingdoms, and until such time as our new king is crowned, that rule would continue. Until our new queen is crowned, someone said. In Grand Maester Munkin's account, the word was Orwiles, spoken softly, no more than a quibble. But Mushroom and Septon Eustace insist it was Lord Beesbury who spoke up, and in a wa waspish tone. King, insisted Queen Alicent, the Iron Throne by rights must pass to his grace's eldest true-born son. The discussion that followed lasted nigh until dawn. Unto dawn, Grand Maester Munkin tells us, Mushroom and Septon Eustace concur. In their accounts, only Lord Beesbury spoke on behalf of Princess Rhaenyra. The ancient master of coin, who had served King Viserys for the majority of his reign, and his grandfather Jaehaerys the Old King before him, reminded the council that Rhaenyra was older than her brothers and had more Targaryen blood, then the late king had chosen her, that the late king had chosen her as his successor, that he had repeatedly refused to alter the su succession despite the pleadings of Queen Alicent and her greens, that hundreds of lords and landed knights had done obeisance to the princess in 105 AC, and sworn solemn oaths to defend her rights. Grand Maester Orwell's account differs only in that he puts many of these arguments into his own mouth rather than Beesbury's, but subsequent events suggest that that was not so, as we shall see. But these words fell on ears made of stone. Sir Tyland pointed out that many of the lords who had sworn to defend the succession of Princess Rhaenyra were long dead. It has been twenty-four years, he said. I myself swore no such oath. I was a child at the time. Ironrod, the master of laws, cited the Great Council of 101 and the old king's choice of Balon rather than Rhaenys in 92, then discouraged at length about Aegon and the Conqueror and his sisters and the hallowed Andal tradition wherein the rights of a true-born son always came before the rights of a mere daughter. Sir Otto reminded them that Rhaenyra's husband <laughs> was none other than Prince Daemon, and we all know that one's nature. Make no mistake, should Rhaenyra ever sit on the Iron Throne, it will be Lord Fleabottom who rules us, a king consort as cruel and unforgiving as Magor ever was. My own head will be the first cut off, I do not doubt, but your queen, my daughter, will soon follow. Queen Alicent echoed him. Nor will they spare my children, she declared. Aegon and his brothers are the king's true-born sons, with a better claim to the throne than her brood of bastards. Damon will find some pretext to put them all to death, even Helena and her little ones. One of these strongs put out Aemon's eye, never forget. He was a boy, I, but the boy is the father to the man, and bastards are monstrous by nature. Bitch. Sir Criston spoke up. 
Should the princess reign, he reminded them, Jaceris Valarian would rule after her. Seven save this realm if we see the bastard on the Iron Throne. He spoke of Rhaenyra's wanton ways and the infamy of her husband. They will turn the Red Keep into a brothel. No man's daughter will be safe, nor any man's wife, even the boys. We know what Lenor was. Oh my god. It is not recorded what Lord Larys Strong spoke a word during this debate, but that was not unusual. Though glib of tongue when need be, the master whispers hoarded his words like a miser hoarding coins, referring to listen, preferring to listen rather than talk. If we do this, Grandmaster Orwile cautioned the council according to the true telling, it must surely lead to war. The princess will not meekly stand aside, and she has dragons. And friends, Lord Beesbury declared, men of honor who will not forget the vows they swore to her and her father. I am an old man, but not so old that I will sit here meekly whilst the likes of you plot to steal her crown. And so saying, he rose to go. As to what happened next, our sources differ. Grandmaster Orwile tells us that Lord Beesbury was seized at the door by the command of Sir Otto Hightower and escorted to the dungeons. Confined to a black cell, he would in time perish of a chill whilst awaiting trial. Septon Eustace tells it elsewise. In his account, Sir Christian Cole forced Lord Beesbury back into his seat and opened his throat with a dagger. Mushroom charges Sir Christian with his lordship's death as well, but in his version, Cole grasped the old man by the back of his collar and flung him out a window to die impaled upon the iron spikes in the dry moat below. All three chronicles agree on one particular. The first blood shed in the Dance of the Dragons belonged to Lord Lyman Beesbury, Master of Coin and Lord Treasurer of the Seven Kingdoms. No further dissent was heard after the death of Lord Beesbury. The rest of the night was spent making plans for the new king's coronation. It must be done quickly, all agreed. And drawing up lists of possible allies and potential enemies, should Princess Rhaenyra refuse to accept King Aegon's ascension. With the princess in confinement on Dragonstone, about to give birth, Queen Alicent's greens enjoyed an advantage. The longer Rhaenyra remained ignorant of the king's death, the slower she would be to move. Mayhaps the whore will die in childbirth, Queen Alicent is reported to have said, according to Mushroom. No ravens flew that night. No bells rang. Those servants who knew of the king's passing were sent to the dungeons. Sir Kristen Cole was given the task of taking into custody such blacks as remained at court, those lords and knights who might be inclined to favor Princess Rhaenyra. Do them no violence unless they resist, Sir Otto Hightower commanded. Such men as bend the knee and swear fealty to King Aegon shall suffer no harm at our hands. And those who will not, asked Grandmaster Orwile, are traitors, said Ironrod, and must die a traitor's death. Lord Laris Strong, Master of Whispers, then spoke for the first and only time. Let us be the first to swear, he said, lest there be traitors here amongst us. Drawing his dagger, the clubfoot drew it across his palm. A blood oath, he urged, to bind us all together, brothers, unto death. And so each of the conspirators slashed their palms and clasped their hands with one another, swearing brotherhood. Queen Alicent alone amongst them was excused from the oath on account of her womanhood. Dawn was breaking over the city before Queen Alicent dispatched the king's guard to bring her sons, Aegon and Aemon, to the council. Prince Daeron, the youngest and gentlest of her children, was in Old Town, serving as Lord Hightower's squire. One-eyed Prince Aemon, 19, was found in the armory, donning plate and mail for his morning practice in the castle yard. Is Aegon king, he asked Sir Willisfell, or must we kneel and kiss the old whore's cunning? Princess Helena was breaking her fast with her children when the king's guard came to her, but when asked where the whereabouts of Prince Aegon, her brother and husband, were, she said only, He is not in my bed, you may be sure. Feel free to search the beneath the blankets. Prince Aegon was at his revels, Munkin says in his true telling, vaguely. The testimony of Mushroom claims Sir Criston found the young king to be drunk and naked in a flea-bottom rat pit, where two gutter snipes with filed teeth were biting and tearing at each other for his amusement, whilst a girl who could not have been more than twelve pleasured his member with her mouth. Let us put that ugly picture down to Mushroom being Mushroom, however, and consider instead the words of Septon Eustace. Though the good Septon admits Prince Aegon was with a paramour when he was found, he insists the girl was the daughter of a wealthy traitor, and well cared for besides. Moreover, the prince at first refused to be a part of his mother's plans. My sister is the heir, not me, he says in Eustace's account. What sort of brother steals his sister's birthright? 
Only when Sir Criston convinced him that the princess must surely execute him and his brothers should she don the crown did Aegon waver. Whilst any true Targaryen, true-born Targaryen yet lives, no strong can ever hope to sit the Iron Throne, Cole said. Rhaenyra has no choice but to take your head if she wishes her bastards to rule after her. It was this, and only this, that persuaded Aegon to accept the crown that the small council was offering him, insists our gentle Septon. Whilst the Knights of the King's Guard were seeking after Queen Alicent's sons, other messengers summoned the commander of the city watch and his captains. There were seven, each commanding one of the city gates, to the Red Keep. Five were judged sympathetic to Prince Aegon's cause when questioned. The other two, along with their commander, were deemed untrustworthy and found themselves in chains. Sir Luther Largent, the most fearsome of the Leal Five, was made the new commander of the Gold Cloaks. A bull of a man, not of a man, nigh on seven feet tall, Largent was rumored to have once killed a war horse with a single punch. Sir Otto, being a prudent man, however, he took care to name his own son, Sir Gawain Hightower, the queen's brother, as Largent's second, instructing him to keep a weary eye on Sir Luther for any signs of disloyalty. Sir Tyland Lannister was named Master of Coin in place of the late Lord Beesbury, and acted at once to seize the royal treasury. The crown's gold was divided into four parts. One part was entrusted to the care of the Iron Bank of Bravos for safekeeping, another sent under strong guard to Casterly Rock, a third to Old Town. The remaining wealth was to be used for bribes and gifts and to hire sellswords if needed. To take Sir Tyland's place as master of ships, Sir Otto looked to the Iron Islands, dispatching a raven to Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, the daring and bloodthirsty 16-year-old Lord Reaper of Pike, offering him the admiralty and a seat on the council for his allegiance. A day passed, then another. Neither Septon's nor Silent Sisters were summoned to the bedchamber where King Viserys lay, swollen and rotting. No bells rang. Ravens flew, but not to Dragonstone. They went instead to Old Town, to Casterly Rock, to River Run, to High Garden, and to many other lords and knights whom Queen Alicent had caused to think might be sympathetic to her son. The annals of the Great Council of 101 were brought forth and examined, and note was made of which lords had spoken for Viserys, and which for Rhaenys, Lena, and Lenor. The lords assembled, fa the lords assembled had favored the male claimant over the female by twenty to one, but there had been dissenters, and those names, ho those same houses were most like to lend Princess Rhaenyra their support should it come to war. The princess would have the sea snake and his fleets, Sir Otto judged, and like as not the other lords of the eastern shores as well. Lords Bar, Emin, Massey, Keltigar, and Crab most like, perhaps even the Evanstar of Tarth. All were lesser powers, save for the Valarians. The Northmen were a greater concern. Winterfell had spoken for Rhaenys at Heron Hall, as had Lord Stark's bannermen, Dustin of Barrowton, and Manderly of White Harbor. Nor could House Arryn be relied upon, for the Eyrie was presently ruled by a woman, Lady Jane, the Maiden of the Vale, whose own rights might be called into question should Princess Rhaenyra be put aside. The greatest danger was deemed to be Storm's End, for House Baratheon had always been staunch in support of the claims of Princess Rhaenys and her children. Though old Lord Bormund had died, his son Boris was even more belligerent than his father, and the lesser storm lords would surely follow wherever he led. Then we must see that he leads them to our king, Queen Alicent declared. Whereupon she sent for her second son. Thus it was not a raven who took flight for Storm's End that day, but Vagar, oldest and largest of the dragons of Westeros. On her back rode Prince Aemon Targaryen, with a sapphire in the place of his missing eye. Your purpose is to win the hand of one of Lord Baratheon's daughters, his grandsire Sir Otto told him before he flew. Any of the four will do. Woo her and wed her, and Lord Boros will deliver the Stormlands for your brother. Fail? I will not fail, Prince Aemon blustered. Aegon will have Storm's End, and I will have this girl. By the time Prince Aemon took his leave, the stink from the dead king's bedchamber had wafted wafted all through Maegor's Holdfast, and many wild tales and rumors were spreading through the court and castle. The dungeons under the Red Keep had swallowed up so many men suspected of disloyalty that even the High Septon had begun to wonder at these disappearances, and sent word from the starry Sept of Old Town asking after some of the missing. Sir Otto Hightower, a methodical a man as he ever served as hand, wanted more time to make preparations, but Queen Alicent knew they could delay no longer. Prince Aegon had grown weary of secrecy. Am I a king or no? He demanded of his mother. If I am king, then crown me. The bells began to ring on the tenth day of the third moon of 129 AC, tolling the end of a reign. 
Grand Maester Orwell was at last allowed to send forth his ravens, and the blackbirds took to the air by the hundreds, spreading the word of Aegon's ascension to every far corner of the realm. The silent sisters were sent for to prepare the corpse for burning, and riders went forth on pale horses to spread the word to the people of King's Landing, crying, King Viserys is dead, long live King Aegon. Hearing the cries, Munkin writes, some wept whilst others cheered, but most of the small folk stared in silence, confused and weary, and now again a voice cri and now and again a voice cried out, Long live our queen. Meanwhile, hurried preparations were made for the coronation. The dragon pit was chosen as the site. Under its mighty dome were stone be benches sufficient to seat eighty thousand, and the pit's thick walls, strong roof, and towering bronze doors made it defensible should traitors attempt to disrupt the ceremony. On the appointed day, Sir Kristen Cole placed the steel and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror upon the brow of the eldest son of King Viserys and Queen Alicent, proclaiming him Aegon of House Targaryen, second of his name, King of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm. His mother, Queen Alicent, beloved by the small folk, placed her own crown upon the head of her daughter Helena, Aegon's wife and sister. After kissing her cheeks, the mother knelt before the daughter, bowed her head, and said, My queen. How many came to see the crowning remains a matter of dispute. Grand Maester Munkin, drawn upon Orwile, drawing upon Orwile, tells us that more than a hundred thousand small folk jammed into the dragon pit, their cheers so loud they shook the very walls, whilst Mushroom says the stone benches were half-filled. With the high Septon in Old Town, too old and frail to journey to King's Landing, it fell upon Septon Eustace to anoint King Aegon's brow with holy oils, and bless him in the name of the seven and bless him in the seven names of God. A few of those in attendance, with sharper eye than most, might have noticed that there were but four white cloaks in attendance on the new king, not five as heretofore. Aegon the second had suffered his first defections the night before, when Sir Stephen Darklin of the King's Guard had slipped from the city with his squire, two stewards, and four guardsmen. Under the cover of darkness, they made their way out a postern gate to where a fisherman's skiff awaited them to take them to Dragonstone. They brought with them a stolen crown, a band of yellow gold ornamented with seven gems of different colors. This was the crown King Viserys had worn, and the old King Jaehaerys before him. When Prince Aegon had decided to wear the steel and ruby crown of his namesake, the Conqueror, Queen Alicent had ordered Viserys' crown locked away, but the steward had trusted with the task had made off with it instead. After the coronation, the remaining Kingsguard escorted Aegon to his mount, a splendid creature, with gleaming gold scales and pale pink wing membranes. Sunfire was the name this, given this dragon of the Golden Dawn. Munkin tells us the king flew thrice around the city before landing inside the walls of the Red Keep. Sir Arik Cargill led his grace into the torchlit throne room, where Aegon II mounted the steps of the Iron Throne before a thousand lords and knights. Shouts rang through the hall. On Dragonstone, nor che no cheers were heard. Instead, screams echoed through the halls and stairwells of Sea Dragon Tower, down from the Queen's apartment where Rhaenyra Targaryen strained and shuddered in her third day of labor. The child had not been due for another turn of the moon, but the tidings from King's Landing had driven the princess into black fury, and her rage seemed to bring on the birth, as if the babe inside, were her angry inside her were angry too and fighting to get out. The princess shrieked curses all through her labor, calling down the wrath of the gods upon her half-brothers and their mother, the queen, and detailing the torments she would inflict upon them before she would let them die. She cursed the child inside her too, Mushroom tells us, clawing at her swollen belly as Maester Gerardus and her midwife tried to restrain her and shouting, Monster, monster, get out, get out! When the babe at last came forth, she proved indeed a monster. A stillborn girl, twisted and malformed, with a hole in her chest where her heart should have been, and a stubby, scaled tail. Or so Mushroom describes her. The dead girl had been... Oh, sorry. The dwarf tells us that it was he who carried the little thing to the yard for burning. The dead girl had been named Visenya, Princess Rhaenyra announced the next day, when Milk of the Poppy had blunted the edge of her pain. She was my only daughter, and they killed her. They stole my crown and murdered my daughter, and they shall answer for it. And so the dance began as the princess called a council of her own. The Black Council, the true-telling names that gathering on Dragonstone, 
setting, ag setting it against the Green Council of King's Landing. Rhaenyra herself presided, seated between her uncle and husband, Prince Damon, and her trusted counselor, Maester Gerardus. Her three sons were present with them, though none had reached the age of manhood. Jace was fourteen, Luke thirteen, Joffrey eleven. Two Kingsguard stood with them, Sir Eric Cargill, twin to Sir Arik, and the Westerman, Sir Lauren, Laurent Marbrand. Thirty knights, a hundred crossbow men, and three hundred men-at-arms made up the rest of Dragonstone's garrison. That had always been deemed sufficient as a fortress of such strength. As an instrument of conquest, however, our army leaves something to be desired, Prince Damon observed sourly. A dozen lesser lords, bannermen, and vassals to Dragonstone sat at the Black Council as well. Keltigar of Claw Isle, Staunton of Ro Rook's Rest, Massey of Stone Dance, Bar Emmon of Sharp Point, and Darklin of Duskendale among them. But the greatest lord to pledge his strength to the princess was Corliss Valarian of Driftmark. Though the sea snake had grown old, he liked to say that he was still <laughs> that he was clinging to life like a drowning sailor clinging to the wreckage of a sunken ship. Mayhaps the seven have preserved me for this one last fight. With Lord Corliss came his wife, Princess Rhaenys, five and fifty, her face lean and lined, her black hair streaked with white, yet fierce and fearless as she had been two and twenty. The queen who never was, Mushroom calls her. What did Viserys ever have that she did not? A little sausage? Is that all it takes to be a king? Let Mushroom rule, then. My sausage is thrice the size of his. Those who sat at the Black Council counted themselves loyalists, but knew full well that King Aegon II would name them traitors. Each had already received a summons from King's Landing, demanding they present themselves at the Red Keep to swear oaths of loyalty to the new king. All their hosts combined could not match the power of the high towers alone could field. Aegon's greens enjoyed other advantages as well. Old Town, King's Landing, and Lannisport were the largest and richest cities in the realm. All three were held by the greens. Every visible symbol of legitimacy belonged to Aegon. He sat the Iron Throne. He lived in the Red Keep. He wore the Conqueror's crown, wielded the Conqueror's sword, and had been anointed by a septon of the faith before the eyes of tens of thousands. Grandmaster Orwile sat in his councils, and the Lord Commander of the King's Guard had placed the crown upon his princely head. And he was a male, which in the eyes of many made him the rightful king, his half-sister the usurper. Against all that, Rhaenyra's advantages were few. Some older lords might yet recall the oaths they had sworn when she was made Princess of Dragonstone and named her father's heir. There had been a time when she had been well-loved by highborn and commons alike, when they had cheered her as the realm's delight. Many a young lord and noble knight had sought her favor then, though how many would still fight for her now that she was a woman wed, her body aged and thickened by six births, was a question none could answer. Though her half-brother had looted their father's treasury, the princess had at her disposal the wealth of House Valarian, and the sea snake's fleet gave her superiority at sea. And her consort, Prince Damon, tried and tempered in the stepstones, had more experience of war hair than all their foes combined. Last, but far from least, Rhaenyra had her dragons. As does Aegon, Master Gerardus pointed out. We have more, said Princess Rhaenys, the queen who never was, who had been a dragon rider longer than all of them. And ours are larger and stronger, but for Vagar. Dragons thrive best here on Dragonstone. She enumerated for the council. King Aegon had his sunfire, a splendid beast, though young. Aemond one eye rode Vagar, and the peril posed by Queen Visenya's mount could not be gainsaid. Queen Helena's mount was Dreamfire, the she-dragon who had once borne the old king's sister Reyna through the clouds. Princess Daeron's dragon was Tessarion, with her wings dark as cobalt and her claws and crest and belly scales as bright as beaten copper. That makes four dragons of fighting size, said Rhaenys. Queen Helena's twins had their own dragons too, but no more than hatchlings. The usurper's youngest son, Maelor, was possessed only of an egg. Against that, Prince Damon had Caraxes and the Princess Rhaenyra Cyrax, both huge and formidable beasts. Caraxes especially was fearsome, and no stranger to blood and fire after the stepstones. Rhaenyra's three sons by Lanor and Velaryon were all dragon riders. Vermax, Arax, and Tyraxes were thriving and growing larger every year. Aegon the Younger, eldest of Rhaenyra's two sons by Prince Damon, commanded the young dragon Stormcloud, though he had yet to mount him. His little brother Viserys went everywhere with his egg. Rhaenys' own she-dragon, Maelys, the Red Queen, had grown lazy, but remained fearsome when, arous when roused. Prince Daemon's twins by Lena Valarian might yet be dragon riders, too. 
Bela's dragon, the slender, pale green moon dancer, would soon be large enough to bear the girl upon her back. And though her sister Reyna's egg had hatched a broken thing that died within hours of emerging from the egg, Cyrex had recently produced another clutch. One of her eggs had been given to Reyna, and it was said that the girl slept with it every night and prayed for a dragon to match her sister's. Moreover, six other dragons made their lairs in the smoky caverns of the dragon mount above the castle. There was Silverwing, good Queen Alisane's mount of old, Sea Smoke, the pale gray beast that had been the pride and passion of Sir Lanor Velaryon, hoary old Vermithor, unridden since the death of King Jaehaerys, and behind the mountain dwelt three wild dragons, never claimed nor ridden by any man, living or dead. The small folk had named them Sheep Stealer, Grey Ghost, and the Cannibal. Find riders to Master Silver Ring, Vermithor, and Sea Smoke, and we will have nine dragons against Aegon's four. Mount and fly their wild kin, and we will number twelve, even without Storm Cloud, Princess Rainies pointed out. This is how we shall win this war. Lords Keltegar and Staunton agreed. Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters had proved that knights and armies could not stand against fire and blood. Keltegar urged the princess to fly against King's Landing at once and reduce the city to ash and bone. And how will that serve us, my lord? The sea snake demanded of him. We want to rule the city, not burn it to the ground. It will never come to that, Keltegar insisted. The usurper will have no choice but to oppose us with his own dragons. Our nine must surely overwhelm us four. At what cost? Princess Rhaenyra wondered. My sons would be riding three of those dragons, I remind you. And it would not be nine against four. I will not be strong enough to fly for some time yet. And who is to ride Silverwing, Vermithorn, Sea Smoke? You, my lord? I hardly think so. It will be five against four, and one of their four will be Vagar. That is no advantage. Surprisingly, Prince Damon agreed with his wife. In the Stepstones, my enemies learned to run and hide when they saw Karak seize his wings or heard his roar, but they had no dragons of their own. It is no easy thing for a man to be a dragon slayer. But dragons can kill dragons, and have. Any maester who has ever studied the history of Valyria can tell you that. I will not throw our dragons against the usurpers unless I have no other choice. There are other ways to use them, better ways. Then the prince laid his own strategies before the Black Council. Rhaenyra must have, a, must have a coronation of her own to answer Aegon's. Afterward, they would send out ravens, calling on the lords of the Seven Kingdoms to declare their allegiance to their true queen. We must fight this war with words before we go to battle, the prince declared. The prince declared. The lords of the great houses held the key to victory, Damon insisted. Their bannermen and vassals would follow where they led. Aegon the Usurper had won the allegiance of the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, and Lord Tywell of Highgarden was a mewling boy in swaddling clothes whose mother, acting as his regent, was, would most likely align the reach with her overmighty bannermen, the High Towers. Oh! Are you okay? <laughs> but the rest of the realm's great lords had yet to declare. Storm's End will stand with us, Princess Rhaenys said. She herself was of that blood on her mother's side and the late Lord Bormond had always been the staunchest of friends. Prince Damon had good reason to hope that the Maid of the Vale might bring the Eyrie to their side as well. Aegon would surely seek the support of Pike, he judged. Only with the support of the Iron Islands could Aegon hope to surpass the strength of House of Alarion at sea. But the Ironmen were notoriously fickle, and Dalton Greyjoy loved blood and battle. He might easily be persuaded to support the princess. The North was too remote to be of much import in the fight, the council judged. By the time the Starks gathered their banners and marched south, the war might well be over. Which left only the Riverlords, a notoriously quarrelsome lot ruled over, in name at least, by House Tully of Riverrun. We have friends in the Riverlands, the prince said, though not all of them dare show their colors yet. We need a place where they can gather, a toehold on the mainland, large enough to house a sizable host, and strong enough to hold against whatever forces the usurper can send against us. He showed the lords a map. Here, Harrenhal. And so it was decided. Prince Damon would lead the assault on Harrenhal, riding Caraxes. Princess Rhaenyra would remain on Dragonstone until she had recovered her strength. The Valarian fleet would close off the gullet, sallying forth from Dragonstone and Driftmark to block all shipping entering or leaving Blackwater Bay. We do not have the strength to take King's Landing by storm, Prince Damon said. No more than our foes could hope to capture Dragonstone. But Aegon is a green boy, and green boys are easily provoked. Mayhaps we can goad him into a rash attack. The sea snake would command the fleet, whilst Princess Rhaenys flew overhead to keep their foes from attacking their ships with dragons. 
Meanwhile, ravens would go forth to River Run, the Erie, Pike, and Storm's End to gain the allegiance of their lords. Then up spoke the queen's eldest son, Cerys. We should bear those messages, he said. Dragons will win the lords over quicker than ravens. His brother Lucerus agreed, insisting that he and Jace were men, or near enough to make no matter. Our uncle calls us strongs, but when the lords see us on dragon back, they will know that for a lie. Only Targaryens ride dragons. Mushroom tells us that the sea snake grumbled at this, insisting that the three boy were Valarians, yet he smiled as he said it with pride in his voice. Even Joffrey chimed in, offering to mount his own dragon Tyraxes and join his brothers. Princess Rhaenyra forbade that. Joff was but eleven. But Jaceris was fourteen, Lucerus thirteen. Bold and handsome lads, skilled in arms, who had long served as squires. If you go, you go as messengers, not as knights, she told them. You must take no part in any fighting. Not until the boys had sworn solemn oaths upon a copy of the seven-pointed star would her grace consent using them as her envoys. It was decided that Jace, being the older of the two, would take the longer, more dangerous task, flying first to the Erie to treat with the Lady of the Vale, then to White Harbor to win over Lord Manderley, and lastly to Winterfell to meet with Lord Stark. Luke's mission would be shorter and safer. He was to fly to Storm's End, where it was expected that Boris Baratheon would give him a warm welcome. A hasty coronation was held the next day. The arrival of Sir Stephen Darklin, late of Aegon's, Aegon's Kingsguard, was an occasion of much joy on Dragonstone, especially when it was learned that he and his fellow loyalists, turncloaks, Sir Otter would name them when offering a reward for their capture, had brought the stolen crown of King Jaehaerys the Conciliator. Three hundred sets of eyes looked on as Prince Daemon Targaryen placed the old king's crown on the head of his wife, proclaiming her Rhaenyra of House Targaryen, first of her name, Queen of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men. The prince claimed for himself the style protector of the realm, and Rhaenyra named her eldest son, Jaceris, the Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne. Her first act as queen was to declare Sir Otto Hightower and Queen Alicent as traitors and rebels. As for my half-brothers and my sweet sister, Helena, she announced, they have been led astray by the Council of Evil Men. Let them come to Dragonstone, bend the knee, and ask for my forgiveness, and I shall gladly spare their lives and take them back into my heart, for they are of my own blood and no man or woman is as accursed as the kinslayer. Word of Rhaenyra's coronation reached the Red Keep the next day, to the great displeasure of Aegon II. My half-sister and my uncle are guilty of high treason, the young king declared. I want them attainted, I want them arrested, and I want them dead. Cooler heads on the Greens' council wished to parley. Parley, whatever. The princess must be made to see that her cause is hopeless, Grandmaster Orwile said. Brother should not war against sister. Send me to her, that we may have talk and reach an, an amicable, amicable accord. Aegon would not hear of it. Septon Eustace tells us that his grace accused the Grand Maester of disloyalty and spoke of having him thrown into a black cell with your black friends. But when the two queens, his mother, Queen Alicent, and his wife, Queen Elena, spoke in favor of Orwile's proposal, the truculent king gave way reluctantly. So Grand Maester Orwile was dispatched, dispatched across Blackwater Bay under a peace banner, leading the retinue that included Sir Arik Cargill of the Kingsguard and Sir Gawain Hightower of the Gold Cloaks, along with a score of scribes and septons, among them Eustace. The terms offered by the king were generous, Munkin declares in true telling. If the princess would acknowledge him as king and make obeisance before the Iron Throne, Aegon II would confirm her in possession of Dragonstone and allow the island and castle to pass to her son Jaceris upon her death. Her second son, Lucerus, would be recognized as the rightful heir to Driftmark, and the lands and holdings of House Valarian. Her boys by Prince Daemon, Aegon the Younger, and Viserys, would be given places of honor at court, the former as the king's squire, the latter as his cupbearer. Pardons would be granted to those lords and knights who had conspired treasonously with her against their true king. Rhaenyra heard these terms in a stony silence, then asked Orwile if he remembered her father, King Viserys. Of course, your grace, the maester answered. Perhaps you can tell us who he named as his heir and successor, the queen said, her crown upon her head. You, your grace, Orwile replied. And Rhaenyra nodded and said, With your own tongue you admit I am your lawful queen. Why then do you serve my half-brother, the pretender? Munkin tells us that Orwile gave a long and erudite reply, citing Andal Law and the Great Council of 101. Mushroom claims he stammered and voided his bladder. Whichever is true, his answer did not satisfy Princess Rhaenyra. 
A grand maester should know the law and serve it, she, turned or she told Orwile. You are no grand maester, and you bring only shame and dishonor to that chain you wear. As Orwile protested feebly, Rainier's knights stripped his chain off of office from his neck and forced him to his knees whilst the princess bestowed the chain upon her own man, Maester Gerardus, a true and leal servant of the realm and its laws. As she sent Orwile and the other envoys on their way, Rhaenyra said, Tell my half-brother that I will have my throne, or I will have his head. Long after the dance was done, the singer Lu Lucian of Tarth would compose a sad ballad called Farewell, My Brother, still sung today. The song purports to relate the last meeting between Sir Arc Cargill and his twin, Sir Eric, of, as Orwile's party was boarding the ship that would carry them back to King's Landing. Sir Arik had sworn his sword to Aegon, Sir Eric to Rhaenyra. In the song, each brother tries to persuade the other to change sides. Failing, they exchange declarations of love and part, knowing that when they next meet, it will be as enemies. It is possible that such a farewell did indeed take place that day on Dragonstone. However, none of our sources make mention of such. Aegon II was two and twenty, quick to anger and slow to forgive. Rhaenyra's refusal to accept his rule enraged him. I offered her an honorable peace, and the horse spat in my face, he declared. What happens next is on her own head. What happened next was war. And that is the end. And we are just about caught up in the show for episode two. Because the next chapter is called A Sons for a Son. Oh my god.